Oh, no, no, not yet. Not yet. Okay, here we go. Hey guys, it's Bruce. Welcome to Combo Courses Podcast, where we talk about everything cybersecurity, specifically GRC, Governance, Risk, and Compliance, Information System Security Officer, and Information Security, if you're not familiar with it. That's what we talk about here. And um, it's really open topics today. My what I really want to address is how I'm going to expand this, what I can do for you over the next three months. Because I'm ex- I'm gonna ex- I'm gonna put more content out there. I'm gonna do more stuff, but I want to know what can I do. What what do you want? I've already been taking suggestions and um, people from YouTube. Some of our regulars on YouTube, some of the regulars on TikTok have asked me to do certain things, and I'm taking notes and trying to figure out more stuff that I can do. You know, not everything will work, but we'll. I, but I can promise you, I'll try. To, to add every suggestion, reasonable suggestion that I get on the channel. So far, I've got um, people want me to expand the community, doing like a, a community thing where we're doing we're more interactive on there. And that's something I, I've been wanting to do. I just need to figure out what platform. What platform do you think I should do? Is it my website? Is it uh, Discord? Is it Facebook? What platform do you recommend that I do? So far, it's been on the website. Most of the votes have been going towards doing on the website, which I can do. Um, I've got people asking me to do certain frameworks. I have a huge master list of different frameworks people are suggesting that I do, and, and those I can totally do. I can have somebody ask me to do more interviews. More interviews is another one that I got in my notes. Um, and I could totally do that. I didn't know if people want that. So I could totally do that because I get people asking me to do interviews. I just I got to line it up with my schedule because I actually do this for real. Like I'm really a GRC guy. I'm really doing this. I'm not like some of the other influencers who don't have a job and that's all they do is do influence stuff. This is like a side piece stuff that I do. Um, but um, I could totally do whatever suggestions you guys want. Another thing is people wanted me to start doing direct sales on TikTok, on YouTube, on wherever. Um, that's something I have to figure out, see if I can do that, like a TikTok shop thing where you can down, you can get direct sales for the book, paperback, ebook, and courses and things like that. That's something I it's gonna take me a while to set it all up so I can do that as well. Any suggestions that you have, I'm here for you. This whole platform is for you. If you guys weren't present if you weren't if you weren't involved then there's no way i would do this so thank you for your suggestions that you already gave me i'm taking notes and anything else any questions you have by the way my name is bruce i've been doing cybersecurity grc work information system security officer work cybersecurity for over 20 years i'm still in play i'm still doing this work I've done work uh, for the government directly, for different agencies, three-letter agencies, different branches of the military. I've done private sector as well. I'm familiar with several different frameworks, standards, and regulations. Um, And I've been an instructor. Like, I've done all of these things and currently doing these things. So if you have any questions at all how to get in this field, how to upgrade in this field, specific questions about frameworks, um, anything, I'll do my best to answer them. I don't know everything. You know, a lot of what, what's great about this community is I've got people on here who know way more than me who can chime in and, and actually answer those questions. So your question doesn't fall on deaf ears. Somebody in this community will know the answer to your question. So just ask it, you know. Um, let me see. I've got some folks following me on TikTok, join in on TikTok. That's great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. If you have any questions, let me know. People joining me on Facebook and on YouTube and and everywhere. And I'm actually doing a live uh, that that I don't normally do directly on Podbean for the podcast. Any questions that you have, I'm all ears. Um, Somebody said, hey, I'm Security Plus certified. And hold a cybersecurity degree, struggling to get a help desk job. Um, 
So miraculous living. Um, I'm going to walk you through some things that you probably hopefully you're already doing. But if not, hopefully these things help you out. Um, so what you want to do is put in your um, in your ATS style resume <clears throat> keywords of all the things that you're skilled on keywords of all the things you've already done keywords of um, frameworks you know um, things you're familiar with everything if you don't know what ATS style resume is ATS stands for application tracking software and it's what most organizations and companies use uh, to ingest or to take in your data for what you do um, from your name to your contact information to your degree to your certifications it'll ingest or pull in all that information with an ATS style resume what a lot of people try to do is make a fancy resume that looks good and looks cool and the fonts all great and the formats all is nice and everything but when they try to upload it into the eight into their ATS style database it won't take in all your it can't ingest your data properly so the first thing you need to do is make an ATS style resume the format is very simple if you don't know what that is go to Google and type in ATS style resume you'll get a bunch of free examples if you want more samples actual resumes like you can use mine go to convocourses.net search through all my stuff I got free stuff I got books I got courses all stuff what you're looking for is my free resume go there you sign up for my, my my newsletter and then download that uh, template you'll get several templates it'll give you an, a sample like this is mine is this is the actual resume I use to get the current job that I have I've updated it since then but that is the that is actually a real resume so download that Take that and use it as an example of what types of things they want to see. The formatting is what you want to look at and what kinds of keywords and stuff that they're really looking for. Now, I'm my specialty is NIST 800. I'm a compliance guy. So I'm not telling you to take word for word what I do. But what I want you to do is take an example of how I wrote the stuff and translate it into what you do. You know. I have a CISSP, put Security Plus in the place of that. Um, I, I went to University of Phoenix, put your you know, degree, replace all the relevant stuff to your, um, customize it to your, to your liking. And then what I want you to do is take another step in improving this resume and go to LinkedIn. LinkedIn is probably one of the best repositories for great professionals putting out their skill set in a resume look for people who are working in the on the help desk and look for what they put on their resume so what you want to do is go to linkedin type in help desk and then instead of searching jobs you'll do that next search for people and look for people who put their full help desk resume online what this is going to do is give you an example a sample actually not an example a sample of what kinds of things a help desk professional should put on their resume. It's gonna give you keywords. You, you'll be surprised on the things that they put on there that you do, that you have done, that you didn't put on your resume. That's the kind of stuff you wanna put on your resume. Uh, you'll, be, you'll see tools that they use, you'll see skills. Why it's important to look at their resume, these sample resumes, is because there's a reason why they're ranking in the top 10 on LinkedIn. It's because they have really good stuff on their resume and you want to put those keywords relevant to what you do on your resume. This is going to put you in the way of people who are looking for you and your skill set. And it's going to make you competitive because you have an ATS style resume. You have all the keywords and key phrases that are that they're looking for that these employers, these technical recruiters are looking for for a help desk technician or field uh, field tech another thing to keep in mind is that help desk is only one keyword that is used another keyword that's that is synonymous to a help desk is a, uh, a customer support technician a tier one support technical support customer service 
technical customer service, things like that also do some help desk type stuff. So help desk isn't the only keyword, key phrase, which you'll notice when you're on LinkedIn looking at other people's sample resumes, by the way. That's the kind of thing that you want to do to start dialing in your resume. Now that ATS style resume, you're not going to stop there. Once you get that resume tight, what you're going to do is you're going to make a profile based off of that resume. You're going to put that profile on the following places. Hope you got a pen and pad ready. You're going to put it on LinkedIn. You're going to put it on the Indeed, Dice. You're going to put it on Career Builder, Indeed. And I would say 10 more places that you can think of. It's not going to be easy work. You're going to, it's going to take some time to fill out all of these profiles, but you want to completely fill each one out until they have 100% complete. Do all of them. It will take you some time. Like set aside some time to actually do this. This really deserves your attention because you're trying to get a job, right? Um, once you've done this, you've got your ATS style resume with all the keywords. It's dialed in to the field that you want to do, which is help desk. Um, you've got, you've put up that ATS style resume on at least 10 different job aggregators, including LinkedIn, Indeed, Monster.com. Don't forget Monster.com. It's one of the best ones. Most of my jobs come from there. Dice.com, Indeed, like all of those. I've probably named one of those twice. But all those plus five more is what I'm trying to get you to do. Once you've got all of that, then you want to get aggressive about applying for jobs. Now, if this is your first position, don't be picky. What you're looking for right now is experience. Some on-the-job experience is actually going to be more valuable than you getting that premier, nice little cybersecurity role that I'm sure you want. Right now, you just want to get your foot in the door for at least six months and put a great impression in that organization so that when you use that to level up in that organization or make a lateral change or switch positions to another company, you want those kudos coming from that company to say, yeah, this guy was a great worker. He was here for six months, but man, he did a great job. That's what you want to so do a great job at this position that you're going to go to. This will take time. This is not overnight. This is not some kind of instant 100K job that you're going to get. This is going to take time to get in position. It's going to take time to mature as an IT professional. And eventually you can build up to to something like what I do, you know, not to my own horn or anything, you know, I'm, I'm by no means stretch of the imagination, some rich guy or something. I'm a normal ass dude with kids and all kinds of problems, you know, <laughs> I'm a normal ass dude, but I'm a normal ass dude who makes six figures and can take some of that money to invest in other jobs and other ventures and under other, uh, I could travel, I can, you know, I, I've got some stuff going on for me because of cybersecurity. I owe a lot to cybersecurity. So, I'm telling you the path that I took and the, what I would do if I was in your position. So hopefully that works for you. Take it one step at a time. Remember that experience is worth its weight in gold. It's it's worth it's very worth your time to get that experience. Um, let me see. What else do we have here? Um, so he says, "Do you think? Um, do you think I'll be able to get remote work?" to work it's possible there are jobs that that are available for entry level like there's data entry type jobs that you can possibly land i'm not saying it's impossible but what i'm saying is if this is your first gig if this is the first time you're trying to get a job don't just focus on remote or hybrid jobs okay right now you want to get experience under your belt this first six, eight months of experience that you're going to get is going to allow you to eventually get a good remote work job. I work remotely, but it took me a long time to get to this point. To get a job that pays well, where I, I could work remotely, th this took a while. This wasn't overnight, okay? So if you want just any remote job, you can find them. You know, you can find a data entry job making... 18 19 dollars an hour 15 whatever dollars an hour you know you can find those jobs you can right now just google it like you can find data entry jobs i'm trying to get you to get a six figure remote job so if you if that's what you're trying to do then it's going to take you some time to do that like that takes time 
even like forget six figures even like a sixty five thousand dollar a year job or fifty five thousand re working remotely with benefits it's going to take it's going to take you a minute to get there it's not it's not overnight so especially if you don't have any experience right it's it's if you don't have experience it's going to take you some time just being real with you um so if this is your first job that you're trying to get what you need to do is get your foot in the door look at local telecoms look at the guys who are uh, fixing routers look at like you need to get your foot in the door as an it professional and those guys who, who hook up your router for your internet or whatever those guys are it professionals those guys are it professionals it's the entry level in some cases not, not all cases but in some cases it's the entry level position they're field techs they're going from house to house they're going you know but I'm telling you get a job like that first get your foot in the door and then you can start you'll start to see all these other opportunities open up once you get your foot in the door but start there don't just try to go straight for a remote job I mean you can but I don't recommend it if you're trying to make if you're trying to make bank working from home then take your time because it, it will take time to do it but it's worth it man it's worth it like I've I've I'm, I'm really blessed you know this is this hasn't happened overnight. It took a long, it took a while for me to do it. I, I was in the military You know, I did eight years in the military. I had to build up experience after the military and stuff. Um, this took a while and this took blood, sweat and tears for me to get to this point, but you can do it. Like you can, you can do it way faster than me. I'm literally telling you how to do it. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. That's why mine took so long, but yours, like if you do what I'm telling you to do, it won't take even half as long as it took me to do to, to get to this level i mean nowadays they're they're just giving six figures away to uh to uh to ex to experienced it professionals um especially if you live on the east coast you can get a six figure fix six figures is not a big deal in the east coast it's just not you know what i mean it's just not there's probably several people who are watching me right now who make six figures um let me see here. I am no one says, oh, thanks for the flowers, by the way. Um, I'm I'm still in college, but I'm planning to take a semester uh, to get into cybersecurity, to get a cybersecurity uh, certificate from the Google courses. Is that a good plan to get a job? Um, what I would do is take that extra semester and try to get some um, some experience on the campus if you can. If there's a way for you to get an internship or an apprenticeship or a working student, they're not going to pay you a lot. But that's not the, the point is not to get paid a lot in the beginning as a student. What you want to do is get that experience because that's what the outside is going to be looking. Once you get that degree in your hand, they're going to really want your experience. <laughs> now, I know that sounds counterintuitive. I'm not telling like the degree is is worth your time like everything you put especially from an accredited college it is worth your time okay certification is great um, and I'll get to that in a second but what I want you to focus on if you do take an extra semester um, try to get take advantage of the stuff that the college and the university is is offering you they might not advertise it everywhere you probably want to go to the front desk and to the staff and say look do you guys have any kind of working students program? I'm trying to get experience. Tell them, break it down. It's like, look, I'm trying to get experience before I get my degree. Um, I want some hands on. What do you guys do? You have internships? Do you have apprenticeships? Do you have working students programs? Is there something I can do to help the IT department to make the make the security on our campus better? Is there something I can do to help the IT department? to to fix systems um, whatever it is get hands-on experience that's important because when you put that on your resume when you get out here in the real world and you start putting that in your in your uh, profile on LinkedIn on monster on dice on whatever you'll be able to say yes I have experience at this university I did X Y and Z I helped them set up the Wi-Fi I helped them do this that and other thing um, certification the certification I would recommend if the college is now if this is all they offer is the is the Google course and go for it like that's fine but the ones that are more marketable are going to be from CompTIA CompTIA has some real marketable courses 
and I know that some of my some of my peers, um, IT professionals, security professionals, and I'm not saying they don't know what they're talking about, but I'm just telling you, I mean, I've been on both sides of this. I've been the person who's interviewing people and I've been on the, the person who's getting interviewed. And CompTIA certifications mean something. They are marketable. People know what they are. People don't really know the Google certifications. I'm not saying don't do it, but they're not as marketable. It, it's it's going to teach you something. You're going to walk anywhere where you can walk away learning something that's great. But and I'm saying, like, if that's all they have, then do it. But the certification that you really want is going to be a, a, a CompTIA A plus or a CompTIA Security Plus will be best. Security Plus, very marketable certification. But you're saying that you can get one semester and Google that you're going to get a, a cybersecurity certification. Oh, from the college. Okay, that's and that's fine. That's fine. But what I said, like what I said before, get that experience. Larry, my man, Larry. Thanks, Larry, man. Thanks for that 10 bucks earlier, man. I appreciate you. That's, look at this. See, you, you keep, you're keeping me well nourished, man. Appreciate you. Larry says, when dealing with C-suite personnel, um, what skill do you find most valuable? I've heard being a good communicator matters. I've also heard that C-suites uh, C like their their info short and to the point exactly so um there's a way to what larry's talking about let me put let me give you some context what well, larry is a is a project manager um who's been transitioning into it cybersecurity pro, as an it secure cybersecurity professional correct me if i'm wrong larry and so larry is is already doing this he's already in this field so this this is the man to talk to if if you're trying to get into this especially if you're trying to do project management him and uh, along with some other people who follow me on TikTok and YouTube and and other places are are already doing this. So Larry is saying, um, he's saying a uh, liquid death. Cheers. <laughs> so Larry is saying that how do you talk to a C level, a C suite personnel? That means like CIO, CEO, CISO. C-level execs, upper level management, the heads of the agency, the people who run run the whole show. How do you talk to them? And in this position as a cybersecurity person, a lot of times you find yourself in that office talking to these higher level people. And like Larry says, to lead this thing off, communication is key. <laughs> it matters. Getting to the point is also key. What I've found talking to directors, and other C-level execs is not only to have an executive summary ready to go, to get straight to the point, keep it short, keep it sweet, is it's not exactly so much what you say is what you don't say. <laughs> because what I found, I, IT professionals who, who have all this information stuck, stuffed in their head, we tend to be very pedantic, meaning we want to keep talking and talking and talking and adding all this information because we know it and we're so anxious to share it, right? But with C-level execs, they don't have time for that. So you got to keep in mind, these guys are in several different high-level meetings that are affecting the financial efficacy of the whole organization. They're doing important stuff is what I'm trying to say. Trying to say. Um, you got to get to the point. You don't want to introduce, you don't want to, one of the landmines is to introduce something that, that's like a gotcha, that wasn't known before. Like sometimes you have to, but it's, man, it's a nightmare. Like when you, you mentioned something that wasn't known before, and it's kind of like, wasn't part of the meeting, you're having a meeting about, tightening up the network, right? And and there's several points that you got to get through, right? You're going to get through those three or four points, get to the point. And then you go ahead and mention that, oh, yeah, we're also working on this um, this lack of, um, of, we have a legacy cryptography on one of our servers too, you know, so that's been holding us back. And you just offhandedly mentioned that. <laughs> and it hasn't been... You haven't vetted that information with anybody. You haven't talked to the network team. You haven't talked to your manager. 
but you just mentioned it on this call that has a C-level exec in there. That's not good. And then they're going to say, well, what do you mean? Could you give me more information? And then you're going to start digging that hole. You're going to start digging, digging the hole to make it worse and worse. <laughs> I'm not saying hide stuff from them. But what I'm saying is any information you get to them is golden standard information. It's been vetted. It's gone through. You've gone. You've technically reviewed it. Like you've gone to your, all the subject matter experts to make sure this is what's going on. You've talked to your manager and said, hey, this is what's going on. You never know. Somebody in your team might have a different approach to where when they when they present it to leadership, the narrative changes because it's been vetted properly. Does that make sense? I'm not telling you to lie or hide things, but everything that goes to them has to be not only straight to the point, but it has to be vetted so that everybody is on the same page. You're talking to the last decision maker. You're talking to the last person who's going to make the final decision on which way we're going to go based off of the information you just provided. So everything that you put forward, in addition to being short to the point and, and very succinct, meaning this is what we're doing very clear, you need to have everything vetted, meaning it's been verified. It's gone through the whole process before it gets to them. It's the gold, you've done the white glove treatment on everything so that you're not blurting things out and leading the whole conversation down this other path. So that's what I found is, is very important to the higher the level that you're talking to, the more everything needs to be vetted, double checked and making sure that it's, it's um, not out of place. And then let me see, I've got a couple other people here that kind of chimed in on this. Um, SVT was another IT professional. Uh, he says, um, short and to the point, uh, but you have to be ready to offer details if they ask. Most importantly, don't BS them. Tell the truth. And uh, even if the truth is not uh, is, is um, that you don't know the answer. So, yeah, great point. Great point. Nailed it. So that's something I did mention is that you need to be ready to provide additional information if they're the ones who bring up that oh yeah we don't have the proper cryptography on our this server you need to be ready to if that's something that's going to come up in the meeting you need to be ready to answer that either do your own homework and be ready to answer it or have a subject matter expert there who can answer it uh in a, in the proper way does that make sense and so one thing i'll do is another thing uh, SVT said is don't BS, don't BS them because th there's a reason why they're in those positions. They're not dummies, right? They they might not be in the weeds, but there's a reason that they got there. There's a reason that they got there. Like there's all these narratives about the good good example is the presidential debate. It was awful. It was, it was hard to watch. Oh, I have so many, so many problems with it. I'm not going to derail this, and I don't care who you voted for, you know. But it was really hard to watch both of those candidates. But there's a reason why they get to that level. Regardless of whatever narrative you put on each one of those candidates, there's a reason they're there. Don't try to BS people in those positions. They they know something you don't know. They're in the, they're in rooms that you're not in. They've heard things you haven't heard. They are privy to knowledge that you don't know. So that said, if you try to BS them, remember they have handlers. They have a whole team around them that's vetting knowledge that's getting to them. They're only getting the best knowledge vetted from people way smarter than anybody in that room. So anything you say to derail that stuff can get very political and can lead everything off in, in another direction. So keep that in mind don't try to bs them because you think they're dumb you know they might they might even agree with you and be like okay that's cool and then go and check double check what you just said <laughs> don't bs them if you don't know the answer just say i don't know sir or ma'am but i'm going to get back to you on that and then you better get back to them on that if you say i'm going to get back to you on that information try to get back to them on that i mean don't try do get back to them on what you just said so i hope that helps
Um, let me see here. Larry says, uh, makes sense. Give them, give them the details that truly matter and leave out information that has potential to only blur and cloud the main point. Is exactly, exactly, because there's so much noise going on, especially in, in a large or medium environments. There's a lot of noise going on, and the meeting we have to keep the meeting on track. Like we don't want to derail. There might be some other issues going on. There might be some cloud issues or server issues, and those those are important. But this meeting's for this specific thing, and we got to keep this thing on track, not dirty the waters, muddy the waters with all this other noise that we can deal with in another meeting and another project. The other smarter people on that topic are already talking about, right? So thank you for that awesome question, as usual, Larry. Thank you so much, man. Um, let me see. I got some other questions here. Somebody said, the answer 318 says, I started my first job at a company. Feel, uh, Field National, it landed a job with the metal co medical company after that. I started my first job at a company, Field National, and it landed a job, medical job after that. Man, congratulations. Congrats. Um, somebody said, well, definitely apply what you told me. Awesome, awesome. Doesn't mean anything unless you do, do the work, like take action. I actually retired out of military and jumped into IT and it's been exciting. Yeah, man, I, it's been it's been very rewarding for me. And in the beginning, for me, it was all like toys and stuff. Now I've been doing this so long. It's just it doesn't have the same excitement as it does. I mean, although you got things like AI happening, because there's always something new happening. It is very exciting. Um, my job now is just a job. It used to be like it was so exciting every day, but now it's, it's really just a job. <laughs> but uh that said, you know, I still got exciting things happening like AIs. I'm, I'm super excited about that and other things. I mean, it's terrifying and, and um, cool at the same time. So I, I still enjoy it, even though sometimes it's a pain in the ass. Uh, Teddy says, uh, what are the roles someone should be looking, uh, looking for after you've graduated? Any role that will pay you. I know that I don't, I'm not trying to <laughs> be disrespectful. But I'm trying to be honest as possible, Teddy. Um, what role should you take after you graduate? So number one, like I tell everybody, before you graduate, get experience while you're in school. Experience with projects. Be a freelancer. Fix people's stuff. Go to the school. See if you can get internships, apprenticeships, work as a working student, anything you can do. But to answer your question, the job you should get after graduation is any job that will take you that's involving information technology don't be like well you know i i'm a i'm a data analyst i have to have a data analyst position start small like maybe there's a job there's something below or uh before the the uh, data analyst role that you could do that's going to help you to build to that data analyst and eventually to a senior data analyst um so any job that's going to pay you when you graduate is a, is a job worth having in information technology. Obviously, if you're trying to be a cybersecurity person, you get a role that says cybersecurity, whatever, or you, you're, you're a machine um, machine learning expert. You want to get a job that's for machine learning. I'm not telling you don't take those jobs. I'm saying it's going to be harder when you first start because you, you're not probably not going to have the experience that some other people have. I'm telling you, the job that's going to take you and pay you in a position that's involving information technology is going to be a very valuable um, first step in the right direction for you. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, I'm going to try to speed run through some of these questions because I think pretty soon I got to get off of here. Um, and again, uh, before I let you guys go, um, please, in the next 12 weeks, I'm going to be expanding this. I'm going to be putting stuff directly on YouTube, on TikTok, on TikTok shop. Anything you guys have suggestions that you want me to do, let me know. I will write it down. I'll take note and I will do my very best. I'll do my damnedest to try to include it into uh, upcoming courses and books and, um, and materials. Um, let me see here. Uh, let me see. Chuck says, will GRC be a thing in the next 20 to 30 years with AI and machine learning? 
uh, what if AI gets more advanced and how GRC, how can GRC be used? So GRC will still be important for AI itself. So right now there's an issue where we're trying to figure, we as a society um, are trying to figure out how to manage GRC, effect of manage AI with GRC, try to put governance, risk, and compliance in GRC implementation. Um, trying to put GRC in an AI implementation. That's what we're trying to do. So I'm <laughs> sounding like Joe Biden here. Um, <laughs> so um, we're trying to do right now is put rec uh, regulations and standards and, and compliance measures in place to help guide uh, large language models that are very helpful. Like, I don't know if you've used them, but it's they're incredible. It's an incredible tool, but that's what it is. It's a tool. It's not in a place where it's going to replace anybody just yet. It just makes too many mistakes. There's just too much going on. It's it's not a magic wand, right? Not yet. Like eventually they're saying, oh, it's going to, you know, once it gets to general artificial intelligence, to be honest, jobs are not going to be the problem when general artificial intelligence comes. When when super intelligence they have they have a few different levels. Let me just explain. <laughs> so this is gonna blow your mind if you've never heard of this shit before. So you've got regular artificial intelligence, right? That's like Claude AI and and Genesis from Google and and and, and open um, open uh, AI, Chat GPT and stuff like that. those are large language models, and um, those are already smarter than the average person. <laughs> way smarter than the average person already uh they can pass any kind of doctor tests in all kinds of they have like a 93 percent pass rate on like the bar the, for lawyers and a 90 percent pass rate on the hardest test any person any of the smartest people that you know can do it's already there so then you got general intelligence, general artificial intelligence, which means it's smarter. It can do anything a human can do better. Anything. Like it could, if you put it in a robot body, it will be able to pick this thing up, drink it, take a sip, put it down, take another one, open it up, give it to somebody, go serve people in a restaurant, drive a car. General general artificial intelligence can do anything a human can do, but better. So large language models are not quite there yet, but they're getting there very soon, like within probably, they're saying by 2030, but it's probably more like 2029. Like it's literally like for four or five years away that it could be, they'll be able to do anything a person can do. <sighs> All right. And that's probably what you're talking about. But there's something above that that's called... Um, super intelligence artificial super intelligence which is smarter than all humans combined <laughs> it's smarter than all humans combined like if you combine all humans on earth it is what so we're like ants to this to this super intelligence so my argument is this let me just get to the point here's my argument once we get to general intelligence and beyond, once we can do everything we can do in five years, jobs are going to be the least of our concern. Because I think it's going to open up a whole nother question of if this thing can do everything a human can do, like what does intelligence even mean? We just made a computer is smarter than any person what does it mean to be smart what does it mean to do anything what is it i think we're going to have an existential crisis where we have to we have to ask ourselves what does it mean to even be conscious i think those questions are going to be way bigger than just jobs that said um will it jobs go away no no i don't think that they will the reason why is because you're going to have to have grc to manage the safety features of the artificial intelligence will be very, very important. Managing them, monitoring them on a continuous basis. That's what my job is doing now on systems that we currently have. <clears throat> It'll be important because, and I'll give you specific examples, is like 
artificial intelligence right now, large language models, if you let them run loose, if you if you do a jailbreak it, you can have it tell you how to make explosive devices. It'll tell you exactly how to do it. it you can tell it how it, it will tell you how to do it <clears throat> in great detail. You can take a picture of all the items in your house and it will be and it can tell you all the ingredients you need to make very dangerous things. So there's safety features in place right now that make it so it can't do that. And wouldn't you agree that that's important to have things like that? Now, that's right now it can do that. Now, think about what it can do once it gets to artificial general intelligence and it's smart as or way smart and can do everything a human can do. What could you tell it to do? What kinds of nefarious, crazy shit could you have an, a system that smart to do what could you have it do let your imagination run wild there's no limits now imagine if it's a super intelligent being where we're like ants what do you think governments are going to do with that thing jobs are the least of our concerns it can make viruses it can make viruses 10 times more communicable and lethal than the than the COVID virus. It could it could do horrible things. And you think that a government isn't gonna hasn't not thought about this? Oh, they're thinking about it. Now let me take it one step further. You still want to think about jobs? It's the least of our concerns. Let me take it one step further. There's there's a few things all happening all at once. I don't want to terrify you, but just just consider this. You've got a few things all happening at once right now. We live in a very exciting time. You've got artificial super intelligence pro within 10 years away. Within, I was probably, it's within 10 years away for sure. All right. Then you have um, the human genomes being cracked. Like people, we're not, we're understanding more about genetics to where they can, they can modify genetics to take away certain diseases. And then you have quantum computing. So quantum computing can crack the most sophisticated cryptography that we have today. It can do things that conventional computers that you and I are on talking to each other right now. It can do things that these computers are not capable of doing. Now, imagine if all those things got merged together, us understanding more about DNA the super intelligent being that makes us look like ants and quantum computing. What if what if artificial intelligence was in a quantum computer? Now what? I'm just saying jobs are like the least of our people. That's all I'm saying is like there's other things that are going to happen that we, you're going to need jobs to manage all this stuff. It's terrifying, and the more you think about it, the more you're going to be like, it's going to blow your mind. It's it's going to make any science fiction that we currently have look like look like when they thought that there was Martians on Mars. You know, the old sci-fi where they're like, oh, there's Martians on Mars. Some crazy shit's happening. Some crazy shit's about to happen. Um, and we're we're in the lifetime that it's about to happen. Uh, what's up, bro? I like sleeping on the weekends, <laughs> but I wake up a little too early. I need to take a nap. <laughs> uh, do you think cyber insurance, cyber insurance may provide a mechanism to provide cybersecurity practices? Excuse me, cyber insurance. Do you mean assurance, assurance or insurance? Um, I'd have to know more about that question here. What? What does a C level exec mean? So that means a CEO, C CFO, CISO. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what will GRC look like in the next 30 years? AI machine learning is increasing. Will it be needed? Absolutely. Yeah, that's what that's exactly what. Oh, is this the same person? Chuck, is this you asking the same question on two different platforms? Okay, we beat that one to death. 
yes, it will still be needed to answer your question. Absolutely, it'll still be needed. Um, humans will still be needed. Uh, weight. So what is a higher than sea level exec? Okay, no, no, no. Okay, let me see. Archer, service now. Um, got some people chiming in here. <laughs> you guys are crazy, man. <laughs> I'm reading some of these. Um, I want I want to start as a pen tester. Uh, audit, then GRC and management. IT audit, then GRC and management. You the kind of GRC is a very big term. So GRC can include pen testing and management because the G is governance, which is management type roles, and the R is a uh, is assessment and auditing type roles. And the C is uh, compliance type roles. So it kind of mixed up a few um, a few things there. I think I accidentally invited somebody hmm. on TikTok, but we'll see. All right. Um, let me see. More questions. I'll answer a few more, and then I got to gotta head out of here. Um, AJ says, for, for someone interest, interested in GRC for coming from... I'm um, coming from tech. Do do you think it's better to pursue a security plus or focus on frameworks such as RMF, uh, CSF, et cetera? Or is it better to pursue a GRC specific cert like OCEG or SANS? Um, from from a technical, if you're a technical person, AJ, um, you are in one of the best positions to go straight into GRC because GRC includes uh, several different things. Um, governance, which is management type roles. If you're trying to go from technical to a, G a governance type role, like a management type role or anywhere where you're, in, you're doing IT management, you're already positioned for that, you know, with your experience in, uh, in the organization you're in. Then uh, R stands for risk. That's assessments and auditing. If you're in a technical role, no, more than likely you've done assessments before or been a part of an assessment process. So you've done part that piece. Compliance is the one that people don't normally have exposure to um, or they don't think that they have exposure to. But if you've implemented security controls, if you've, if you've written or helped to write or reviewed a policy or a, uh, an SOP or written anything for your organization, that's actually part of the co compliance. One of the things that we need to know is uh, like technical writing. So you've kind of done some of these things more than likely if you are in a technical role. So now what you need to do is start being competitive. Security Plus is a very competitive certification that will put you in a position where you can start your journey in, into getting into a, a, a legit GRC type role. Another thing is determine what you want to do. Are you trying to focus on the C, the compliance piece, the frameworks? If that's the case, you want to get familiar with one of these frameworks. More than likely, you already have exposure, and you need to figure out which one you have been exposed to. What you can do is think about what industry you're in. Are you in retail? Are you in the government? Are you in business sector, financials, whatever? All of those use some framework that you probably are familiar with. If you're in the healthcare industry, HIPAA, that's what it is. HIPAA, Hit Trust, is a framework that they use to guide them through the process. HIPAA is the regulation that they use to protect patient information. Um, if you're in the banking industry, you're in fintech, they use Sarbanes-Oxley, um, GLBA is another one, the regulation. I think that's what, what it's called. Um, they use uh, PCI DSS in some cases, Sarbanes-Oxley, if I didn't already name that one. They use, there's several ones that you probably are already doing. You just didn't know that you're that is that is that is that framework. So now you just need to read the actual manual and get more knowledgeable on it. Another one, if you're in the government sector, this is my specialty. If if you are in the government sector at all, you've definitely done risk management framework for sure. Um, or NIST CSF. You just didn't know you were doing it. When you're applying controls on a system, you're actually applying controls based off of FISMA, which is a federal regulation, which has us implementing NIST 800 controls. You just need to get familiar with whatever industry you're in 
And then I would, whatever, based off of whatever industry you work in in tech, find out what frameworks, regulations, and standards are in there and then start reading them. And I guarantee you a light bulb is going to go on and be like, oh, this is what we're already doing. Okay, this is when I already, I set up this, this, uh, this server and we used X, Y, and Z. It's in compliance with, with this standard or this regulation. You probably are, if, you, if anybody, all you guys, if you guys are doing any kind of IT, management work, any kind of scanning, vulnerability management, anything like that, contracting even, you have been exposed to one of these regulation standards um, and frameworks. You just need to know which one it is and figure out uh, how to articulate it on your resume. Guaranteed. And I see you uh, live here, Moto, and I, I'm going to stop this live here real soon i will be taking um some some people maybe next week uh but for now i'm gonna end this thing right now i gotta go do some business but thank you so much shout out to larry thank you larry for this appreciate you um and if you guys have any suggestions on which direction to go for this channel i'm gonna in the next 12 weeks i'm gonna be expanding it putting more stuff in here um more things for you to consume more more grc work so that you guys so i can my mission is to get more people into this field to have a better life for yourself and for your family and do the things you want to do it's not really about grc it's what the thing grc can bring for you with a better uh more secure job that's what this whole thing's about all right guys i gotta go peace and love appreciate